Hey guys, we're in my home office today. Uh, the workshop was a bit cold and I thought I could do this video from here and, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's been a while since I put up a video and having just finished a new version of the software, uh, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to take some time and put together a video which more thoroughly covers not only just the new features but also dives deeper into some of the topics and questions that have come up in the comments and uh, email conversations with y'all who have been working on this and trying to, to make it work in your own environment. Uh, you'll find an index in the description of this video so you can skip past the boring and uh, long parts and get to the stuff that you care about. So let's dive right in and take a look at the new version of the software. All right, so we're going to start by going through the download of the software. Um, you'll go to www.reloadingrecipes.com. I put the link in the description of the video. Uh, once you get to this page, you'll click on the head stamp sorter project in the middle. Um, this will require a sign in, so you'll need to register for an account if you don't have one. Once you've done that, you'll see this page, and as you scroll down, you'll see the latest version of the software available. I've created quite a bit of new features and bug fixes, so for those of you who are already doing this project, I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. The new version works a ton better than the old version. But before we go into that, I wanted to mention that for you that are just starting out, um, you'll want to make sure that you have the, the, v plus, the VC++ redistributables. Um, also, you need to make sure you're on a CPU that's supported. And so some of the older processors don't have AVX support, which is required for the software to run. So like some of the Celeron processors will not work. So just check with your um, machine information to see if, if your processor supports uh, uh, the instructions, the AVX instructions. After that, uh, we'll go ahead and download it. Also, for those of you who are already um, doing this project, you'll need to get the latest version of the Arduino code from the GitHub repo. Uh, there's some changes in the software and it requires um, a little bit of a code change in the Arduino side. So I've already downloaded this and let's go through the install. So it's going to be in my downloads folder. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep everything default and install it fresh. For those of you who are upgrading, um, you can upgrade. It's the exact same process. It'll keep all your settings and all your current trainings and images will, will remain. So you can just um, go through the same process. So once that's completed, I'll have um, this AI head stamp sorter. I'll also probably see it you know, in your search menu here, which you can launch and you'll have to sign into the software. So this would be the same account you used in the, in the web application. And I have the clickiest keyboard um, today. All right, so on to the first feature. Um, in previous versions of the software, we didn't support um, any sort of emulation. Uh, it, you had to have a device connected to even use the software, an Arduino configured device. This version, I've created an emulation mode, which allows you to play with the software without having a device. The only requirement is that you do have a, a webcam attached or some kind of camera attached to um, the laptop that you're doing this on or the machine that you're doing this on. So I didn't have an Arduino connected. I didn't have a sorter connected. So it's actually just going to switch automatically into emulation mode. And here we are. We're, we're at the first tab, which is the configuration tab. And we'll go through this a little bit. Um, you'll see, first of all, that we're in emulation mode. And whenever you're in that, you'll see the red here at the top. You'll also see uh, the, the COM port is set to emulated. If you wanted to leave emulation mode um, and you attached and you have a sorter Arduino, you could attach it um, to your USB port and then rescan and then that will show up and you can change it. Same thing if you're in uh, regular mode and you want to go to emulated, you could unplug your Arduino and rescan and you'll end up back in emulated mode. Um, the, but at the top of the configuration, the first thing we have is our cameras. And so you'll choose the camera in this case for the demo I'm just going to use the integrated camera 
you can preview that and that will show you um, what this one is blocked right now so I'm um, not going to see much there but if you end up plugging a camera in after the, a new feature is to just refresh the list of cameras so that you can see that without having to close and reopen the software the next um, section here is the serial port and the same kind of thing goes here if you have multiple devices you'll see a list of all your com devices here and if you plug something in after you've loaded the software you can hit the rescan ports to um, show those new devices following down the line a little bit we have some of the most popular settings or the things that i find myself tweaking and changing the most which is the speed of the motor the the feed cycle steps the the sort motor speed and then the sort uh, the slot steps so the increment the number of steps between sorting slots so these if you change them they will actually only they don't actually update the arduino code but they do update the config in the arduino so while it's running it will use these settings however if you restart the arduino it will revert back to whatever it's programmed to do there is an option here to initialize the settings on startup this is this is the initialization within um, the app so every time this app starts if you've changed these it will push those settings to the arduino and so it can use those but if you find long-term settings that work i recommend updating those in the arduino code directly each one of these represents a parameter or, or a variable that's listed towards the top of the code that you can set um, beyond that we have it hitting the update settings actually pushes those changes uh, to the arduino by default when this loads if you have an arduino connected it will read those settings from the arduino and populate this these fields with what the arduino is set up as so um, another feature test feed this won't do much in emulation mode in fact it won't do anything because there's um, no motors or anything attached but if you have the device attached this would then feed um, your indexing wheel one one rotation and this other element here this the test sorter slot is a new feature but as you change this number you'll see your sorter arm move to that slot and this is helpful for aligning your buckets if you're not using the sorter plate which i've kind of moved away from uh, the big round sorter plate that has the holes in it i'm using a minimal device now or the minimal uh, sorter setup and so i just kind of align my buckets how i want them and i don't have to deal with uh, the alignment of that plate anymore so as you change this the, the motor will move the sorter if everything's working and connected correctly the last section here is image processing uh, there's been a lot of questions about what image processing is and i wanted to cover that a little bit so when we take a picture of the brass, we have uh, a pretty big picture, usually mostly black background with a little uh, circle, which is your, your brass head stamp. And if I pass that into the computer for training, majority of the images will be the same. And so by centering, by detecting where that piece of brass is in the image and cropping it out, I end up with an image which is mostly the data that I want to train on, which is just the head stamp. This also allows me to rotate the image to, so I can create more variants of that image. Because as you feed brass into this machine, it's not always going to fall in the same orientation. I mean, I think the odds of that are, are really slim. And so by adding more rotations, you get more training and better results. And so I usually set this to eight rotations and I will keep this as enabled. Now fine tuning, is a function that allows you to um, tune the image processing and so if you have some images which don't seem to be cropped correctly or centered you can send those for fine tuning uh, i'm going to go ahead and load one from the save so i don't actually have one in there yet i will get one from the emulation folder though so in fine tuning we have scan precision and this is how many lines to skip when trying to find the brass. And so the lower this number, the slower uh, the processing will be. As you can see, processing time at one is over half a second. If I go to two, you see it's about half of that value. And if I go to four, um, you'll see it's even, well, half of that. So I generally 
recommend somewhere around 4.3, and then I can save those settings. Crop padding is the kind of black space around the image. So the more you add, the more, the smaller this will be and the more black you'll have around it. So once you figure out, you know, with every camera and lighting situation, this might need a little bit of tweaking. The scan sensitivity measures the difference. So when it's finding this, the difference between the background and the, the, the casing. So it's based on a percentage. And if you change sensitivity to one and scan precision to one, you'll have the, the best possible image, but also the slowest. Um, I end up usually at three or four for precision sensitivity. You can see, you won't see a lot of change in sensitivity. It doesn't affect time at all. It's really just um, something you would use when you're trying to get the best pictures. You'll have to play with it. So I recommend, you know, somewhere around 4.3, 4.2, anywhere in here is probably okay. So I can save those. Back to the configuration. I think we've covered everything in this tab. So let's go on to the next one, which is training. By default, we create a model, the nine millimeter default model, but there's some new functionality in the model and I wanna cover that before we come into the training tab. So let's jump into the models tab. And here is where you can see which cartridges you've configured. So, and then the, the training models for that cartridge. So if you were gonna use like 223 or 556, you could put the cart that cartridge here and then you could, it will create a default model, but you can add additional models. I'm going to add an additional model just you know, for this video so we can look at the new features here. And so my model will be uh, 9mm uh, video demo. And then underneath here, we have three modes that this model can be set for, which is normal. That just shows the entire head stamp. Primer only. This is where we crop just the primer section out of the um, of the head stamp so that we only look at the primer area. And this is helpful if you're going to sort stuff by large and small primer. So you don't get the rest of the head stamp. You really just see that primer pocket. And this greatly increases the recognition on that. And then you would really only have two classifications, which is large and small primer. Um, or if you were doing some kind of other thing like checking for upside down primers, you might have a classification for right side up and upside down. Um, hide primer is a new feature which actually helps the learning quite a bit. And this is really where we just put a black spot over the primer. So we don't wanna use the primer data for our training. We really only care about the head stamp. And then the mask size is actually relevant for both primer only and for hide primer. So for hide primer, it's how big of a black spot we put over the primer and primer only is how much of that center of the brass to crop out. So I like to set this to 120. And then the lastly, there's a, a new checkbox here for use deep learning. And this um, is a new feature as well that I'm really excited about. It switches the model from using um, Google's inception to using Microsoft's uh, MLNet image um, recognition and deep learning. So it actually, I found up to 30, maybe 50% improvement. It is a little slower to train, but we're seeing really good results uh, from my beta testers. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and hit create here. And then um, we'll come back to the training. You'll see always in the top corner, which is your active model. We don't have any classifications at this point. And we, or the classification is basically a head stamp. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple, but before I do that, I'll enable rotations. So we'll see, we're always gonna add blank. Um, I'll make that all caps. And then I know I'm gonna have a couple, so I'm gonna have a FC and I'm going to have um, win. So save here saves this head stamp to uh, the AI sorter software database for this particular model um, so that it's available when you're doing runs and you're doing um, training and sorting. Since we're in emulation mode, when you hit feed at this point, you will see it's going to pull from that emulation folder 
it's going to randomly pull a piece of brass from that folder and drop it in here. And the first thing we're going to notice, we have our eight rotations. Everything is cropped and centered nicely. So here's our original image. It has some artifact in it, but it looks like everything is set up well. We'll also notice there's a black dot over the primer area. So we're kind of excluding that from the training. And this is exactly what we want. So at this point, we, we haven't trained any model. And so there's no detection happening. I can see that this is CBC and I don't have a CBC. So I could add that here. And when I hit save, it's just gonna, all save does is give me an option to set it. I still have to go and add this image set to my training. So I would hit add image and then I would hit feed to feed the next one. So this can be a little tedious and it, and it actually just loaded the same image so you didn't see it. This happens sometimes in emulation mode. I don't have a lot of images so and it is random so it can load the same one, but we'll hit feed again. And now we have another cartridge which is Aguila. Now I wanted to show you another feature which is kind of an automation feature um, rather than have to hit save, add, and feed, I can kind of combine those in these menus. And so um, in this case, I'm going to use the longest one, which combines save, add, and feed, and also add and feed. So when I do this, and then I set this to Aguila, it's going to go ahead and, and you know save it, hit the add button, and then it will feed, it, uh, feed me another one. And so... I think I already did a win, a win, and so in this case, all I have to do is hit add image and it will actually feed me another one because of this mode. And so we'll go through this a little bit um, and just see what we get. GFL is a new one, so I'll hit save. And we have another GFL loaded, so I'll hit just save again. So if you already have um, a headstamp, sort of a shortcut to hit it again, it won't add it twice into the menu, you could hit save or add if, if this is the correct uh, designation. So we don't have Hornaday yet. And GFL we have. So we don't need to do a ton right now. Um, I'm going to just do a couple more and we'll do a training. So we'll just stop right there. We have spear, but well, we're gonna wait until after we train to do that one. So this is a new feature as well. Before it was just kind of giving the spinny mouse and I think um, that could be confusing. So I added this sort of splash screen to give you something to look at while this is training. but. Um, as you add more and more head stamps, this process can take a lot longer. I expect this will take just a couple minutes, so we'll let that run. Okay, the training has completed. So now that we have a model that's been trained, it's not trained very well. I mean, it only has a few um, examples in it but it will try to predict what the next head stamp is. So I'm going to hit feed and you'll see with 95% confidence, it thinks that it's a Hornaday and it is correct. So um, in the training, I, I will continue to add images more in deep learning mode. More is more, more is better. So we'll go ahead and add image and that will feed another one. So we have a new head stamp. It looks like RP. We'll go ahead and add that one. And then see it's picked up the next one is win. So this becomes a little easier. Um, we can just keep hitting add on this because we already have. All right, now we have FC. So it picked it up as CBC with 58% confidence. And so we're gonna correct that by setting it to FC. We still have to add the image so CBC is correct. We'll go ahead and add that. And so we'll go through this process a few times. And I, I will um, sometimes spend an hour or more just training um, these models.
if you make a mistake here, there's another feature that will also allow you to correct that, which um, was kind of a pain in the past. So um, I'll be showing you that as well. So I'm going to do one more training and then we'll see um, much better results. Okay, our second training is completed. And now I'm just kind of going to browse through this a little bit and see the first time you hit feed after a training, you'll notice there's a little bit of a lag as the model loads up. Um, but now we're seeing some RP is 93% and it is correct, Hornaday 97. So we're getting pretty decent confidence levels um, and really nice recognition. So this one you can see has a confidence of 30, it's a Gila and it's actually CBC. I'm gonna leave it as it is for now. Just kind of want to point that out. This lower confidence has a higher potential to be wrong. Um, we never trained Spear, so again, 51, for and it's thinking it's Hornaday, so it doesn't know about Spear yet. But this plays into um, the next tab. I wanted to mention a couple uh, other features here, or a couple other things about how this works. So. The process is that we add a bunch of images into a folder with head stamp classifications associated to those images. And then when we have an image repository built up, we train that repository into a fixed model. And so we can go and remove images and hit train. We can add more images and hit train and it will build a new model. And that model will be used um, to detect future images. So. Um, in the model management, we'll look at that a little bit more and, and where those files are stored in the operating system. So if you want to manually do some um, changes there, you can. The other feature that you might have noticed up here in the corner is save for IP tuning. And so if you get one that feeds and it just doesn't look like it's cropped right or it's crooked or something, it doesn't look like image processing worked correctly, what I would do is go ahead and hit save for IP tuning. And what that will do is it will drop that image, the, the raw image, into the IP tuning folder so that when we go back into configuration and the fine tuning and we go to load it, we'll see that other image that's available there. So um, I think that's pretty much everything on this particular tab. Let's go into the models and look at the model that we just uh, started to build. So we'll click on manage models and this is a, a new screen and we can click on the model that we worked on and now we can see the cartridges or, or the head stamp pictures that we took and there's 184 of them. We took basically eight of each and here is a filter that you can just look at the ones that I classified as FC. So if you want to scroll down and say, did I accidentally put a Winchester in the FC or, you know, did I put an FC in the win? If you had made that sort of mistake, um, you can fix it individually by clicking on one of these and, and reclassifying it, or you can take these check boxes and reclassify. So if I move these uh, PMCs, let's just move them around. We'll, we'll set them as blank. So we hit the reclassify. So this is what we're going to change them to. We're going to hit reclassify. Now if I go and set this to blank, I'll see those are here. If I want to move one at a time, I can come in here and set them back to PMC. Or I can check the boxes, which is much faster. Um, of course, this won't affect anything until you retrain. So after you've done your fix-ups, then you have to come back here and just hit the train model button, which will rebuild the model with your updates. All right, one thing I forgot to show was there is now a link um, up here, which you can click and that will open the folder in your operating system where those images are actually held. And so you can see the path here. Two represents the ID of this particular model. Um, one would have been the default model and two is the one I just created. But you can see um, all of these images and this is where you could click
clear out the bad ones if you want. One of the things you'll notice is the beginning of the image name has the classification in it. So those classifications need to exist. So you can't just rename this to Winchester because Winchester won't doesn't exist in your list of head stamps. So if you wanted this to be renamed to Winchester, you need to make sure that you have added, you know, Winchester to your head stamp list or you'll kind of have some disconnects there. The format is classification name and it should match what's in the software and then two underscores and then uh, basically a unique string or this is a timestamp. If you wanted to bulk rename um, images, you can actually use like any kind of automation you're familiar with. If you want to use command prompts or something like that, you can you can do that here. Ultimately, once you've made your changes, you would come back into the software and hit train model. If you didn't uh, blow anything up, everything should work just fine. If you've uh, if you have stuff that's the wrong format you might see errors here. All right, so the next part we're gonna look at um, is the run menu, and there's a few new features here as well. We have the counters. We also have um, a ability to reset the counters. If you've made slot configurations, there's a function for um, clearing them quickly so you don't have to go through each one. There's also a new uh, option for automatically select trays. And so in this particular mode, as stuff comes in, it's going to automatically assign them on a first come first serve basis, which is kind of helpful. I would say one other thing to you can do here is if you always want slot one to be Aguila and slot two to be FC, you can still use this functionality because it's not going to uh, override an assigned tray. So you can hit start and then anything that's not Aguila and FC will start to fill in the remaining slots. Another neat functionality is you can set a confidence floor. So if we say I only want to sort stuff that's a confidence of 95 and higher then anything that doesn't meet that confidence floor gets sent to the catch-all folder so if we set this to say 90 percent then with only when the machine has a 90 percent or higher confidence will that um, head stamp be classified into that slot so if we get start again here we should see um, a little bit more going into the catch-all folder here as it doesn't meet the 90%. So that 80, 85, 83, these are going to end up in the catch-all. If you set this too high, you'll end up with a lot of stuff that would have been classified otherwise. So I, I, I usually set it at about 80% because at the 80% mark, I found almost always it's right on when I'm using the deep learning model. The other option, the other um, new feature here is a manual feed. If for some reason you're in here and you want to just feed one more, the manual feed button will do that for you. I think that pretty much takes us through everything from this particular screen. So finally, I just want to go through a little bit of the folder structure of the software and talk about a few of the concepts like backing up your data. Um, if you wanted to uh, reinstall or something like that, but didn't want to lose your, your stuff, we'll, we'll go into that here right now. So in the, the path should be, if you, if you kept everything default, C program files, SJ Seth, um, you can actually see I made a copy of my whole folder here, which for backup reasons, that, that's a pretty good technique. The most important stuff uh, for your data, stuff that you've done, will be your data folder. It has your database, which has all your models and head stamps. And then the 
training folder, which has all of the trainings that you've done. So in this case, all of my head stamps are here. If you wanted to add um, images for emulation mode that, you know, that will also get selected randomly, you can just drop them right into this folder and they will show up in emulation mode. The tuning folder, uh, as I mentioned before, is where stuff gets sent for fine tuning. And so backing up the training and the data folder would be key. Licenses, if, if those get deleted, you'll just have to like log back in and it will regenerate the license. You'll need an internet connection, of course, to do that. Once you um, have connected and those licenses have been generated, this will work in offline mode. So like my workshop doesn't get good Wi-Fi. Um, so often I'm working in uh, offline mode there. So I think that pretty much covers the um, software will go out to the workshop in a little bit and talk about some of the new features and where we're going with this in the future. I wanted to wrap this video up by talking about the future of this project and show you some of the innovations or some of the, the changes I've made uh, to improve it and kind of talk about where we're going with this. Um, so from the start, this was sort of uh, an experiment and I'm kind of moving into the phase where I want to complete it, call it done. That's not to say that I want to walk away from the project at all. Um, it's just that I want to narrow everything down to one a revision of the hardware. So for instance, um, this was a great enclosure with the TB 6600s, one of the um, Anti colon, I think was the name, but uh, had donated this or, or um, uploaded this to the repo. Really nice enclosure, works really well. I've done some modifications to it, but um, really great. I had, you, you saw a video on the Arduino Uno Shield. Um, I kind of want to make one way to do it going forward so that new users or new people who want to take this on uh, don't get confused. So that's sort of my goal is to move all of this into one step-by-step um, -step build tutorial. And that's what I've been working on. I'm calling that version CS 7.1. There's not any huge fundamental changes to the design of CS 7, but there are some improvements. Uh, some of those include uh, the new camera module, which I'm not gonna be able to probably show it right here, but it has uh, a fan and the um, blower blows all the dust out, kind of creates an air shield. It also um, has an adjustable light, so the, the boxes all have potentiometers on them to uh, adjust the lighting on the fly. I've added a drop sensor, which uses a proximity sensor that knows that a brass is dropped all the way down onto it, so it won't feed until uh, the drop has been completed. You'll see this wheel has bearings in it, and I'm starting to use threaded rod to run those. Uh, just a number of innovations. So I'm going to be releasing a build series on those and going more in depth. There's been a lot of questions as I do these, uh, you know, what, what are your print settings? What, what do we use for this and that? And I want to just in high detail go through each aspect. And so I'll be creating videos for those in the near future. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at with this project. I don't, um, expect to walk away from it at all. I, I really want to develop more on the software side, but I do kind of want to call the hardware done. And in order for me to do that, I need to have it to where people aren't hitting me up for questions every day on stuff that I probably should have just covered in the video to begin with. So that's where we're going with this. Thank you for uh, following along in this journey with me. And uh, I love you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, all the feedback you give me and comments and the personal emails that have been sent videos of your own projects are greatly appreciated i'd love to at some point put together a collage of um, a video collage of all the different implementations you all have done um, excited to see where this all ends up i'll see you guys later